Hello everyone, how's it going? And welcome to the Atari video computer stream here on twitch.tv slash mockduck. If you want to give me a follow, I'd sure love that if you feel like kicking in a couple of bits to help out the Maple Farm Sanctuary out of Menden, Massachusetts. All the revenue outside of what Twitch takes and what PayPal takes does go to that. Hey, I'm not at a computer. I've got a video thing. I'm on kind of a little mini vacation right now, so I thought I'd do something a little bit different for today's Atari video computer stream and uh, kind of go through some of the basics of collecting the Atari, some of the things that you can do when you first get your Atari, when you first get your carts, do some Q&A on some of the basics. So if you don't collect Atari and you want to get started, this is a stream for you. If you're curious about the art of collecting old video games, this is also a good place for you. And who knows, maybe later on I'll actually boot up some Atari games and do that sort of thing as well. Ooh, this candelabra. Yeah, I found this, uh, that candelabra right there at a junk store just the other day. So, as you can see, I've got three of my Atari units out, and I'll be talking a little bit about how some of these things work. I guess I should probably get the logo on that one. So let me move my Twitch chat board here. This way I can keep an eye on, on what people are saying. Welcome again, everybody, to the Atari Video Computer Stream every Sunday, at least for the foreseeable future here on twitch.tv slash mockduck. All right, so you want to get started in Atari. You're thinking, man, I would love to get that VCS. You know, I grew up with Atari. Maybe I didn't grow up with Atari, but I want to learn about video games and you want to pick up your very first Atari. Well, okay, what should you look for? What are the different models? And then how do you get ready to clean it, get it up to date? We'll be doing some basic maintenance. How do you take this sucker apart? And all that sort of thing. So first off, let me start with the basics. If you want to get an Atari 2600, also known as an Atari VCS video computer system, it was renamed the 2600 when the Atari 5200 came out uh, in the mid 80s. You know, to differentiate that it was, the 5200 was twice as fast, twice as good, and all that sort of thing. But the name stuck in the minds of collectors. So technically you're looking for a VCS or a Sears Telegames. They're the same thing. So if you see something for an Atari VCS, a Sears Telegames, an Atari 2600, it's all the same system. They'll all play the same games. The difference is mostly cosmetic. So this is the, well, this is the first major one. There was one model that came out before this that's called the Heavy Sixer. That's the one that's most valuable for collectors. And the reason it is the most valuable for collectors is it has the heaviest build, the highest quality, the most RF shielding. So you get the best picture for the most part. And they're the oldest, they're the highest, uh, most collectible. However, they're not too easy to find you'll pay a pretty penny for them. This one is close. This is a traditional heavy sixer, not what, you'll get this, this confused a lot. People will call it a heavy sixer when actually they just mean a six switch. But you can see the difference right here. I notice I've got a chip on this one, but see how it's got a angle? If it's rounded, that is an actual heavy sixer. If it has this corner cut, if it's more sharp on the edge, that's a regular six switch Atari. That's fine. They're all good. No matter what kind of Atari you get, they're going to be perfectly fine. The heavy sixers, if you see on Craigslist and you see a picture of something like this and they're saying, I've got a heavy sixer for sale, they probably don't. They probably have a six switch Atari. The difference is the heavy sixer was actually made out of California in the Sunnyvale Atari headquarters. It was the one that was released in 1977, generally until about 78. At that point, they continued to make them in California, but they also used some parts from China. They made it cheaper, uh, they could scale better, and so they did that. There's some inside differences that I'll talk about in just a little bit, but a six switch like this is very similar to the other Ataris in terms of build content and all that. It is still a little bit heavier, a little bit sturdier. I might recommend, if you just want to buy one Atari, and you find a good deal on one, get a six switch. Reason for it, it has six switches on and off, color and black and white TV. Yes, people used to have black and white TVs in their home and they liked it. Uh, the big difference between this and the four switch, 
is these two right here. This is a left difficulty switch and a right difficulty switch. On the 4 switch, they moved the what was the left and the right difficulty switch to the back. See these knobs here? They're just little plugs. Same thing in terms of what it does, left and right difficulty switch, but that's the big difference between the 4 and the 6 switch. It just tends to be a little bit sturdier. You can actually, if you were to pick these up, this is almost twice as heavy as this one is right here. And then you've got the game select. That'll be the various different game modes that you do on each cartridge, and then game reset, which is generally what you do to start playing or to reset your game once you're done. All right, so let's uh, start off actually with the six switch. Uh, this one is a little bit harder to take apart, but since it's older, there's a better than average chance you might need to do some cleaning. So what happens when you get an Atari 2600 and it's dirty as heck? You don't know if it runs. Or you plug it in and it doesn't run. Don't throw that thing away. Ataris are built like a truck. They, can, they could get run over by a tank and still probably work. Now, circuit boards can get fried, but there's a pretty good chance with a good cleaning and a little bit of care you too can get just about any Atari you want to set up. Okay, I'm going to spoil combat because someone in there, there's two tanks. <laughs> you can even play as invisible jets. All right, so what do you need to do to take an Atari apart? First off, is it dangerous? No. It's fine. Don't wanna, there's nothing that's going to kill you inside of this thing. Uh, the big difference between a 6 and a 4 switch, which I'll get into in just a little bit, is how you detach the circuit board from the case. One of the things I would recommend just about anybody do when you first get an Atari is give it a good clean. Over time, you get dust, you get crud, you get all sorts of stuff in there, similar to what you see in the Sega Genesis or Nintendo and all that, but Ataris in particular get pretty cruddy in there. So here's how you do it. If you just care about the cosmetic on the outside, you can get some rubbing alcohol and Q-tips and those kind of go psh, 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 get in there like a museum person and spend hours doing that. Or you could do what I'm going to do right here and take the sucker apart. You need a Phillips head screwdriver. It's all you need. You'll see there are six screws that you're going to need to undo. Leave these two on for now. These two are what keep the circuit board to this bottom case. We'll take that off eventually. But for now, you've got one there and one on the other side. You've got uh, two on either side here that you need to take off. And then, these are the hardest ones to see, but you can kind of see it in this light. See these two? There are two in here as well. So, if you want to take out the Atari 2600, you just take your screwdriver, If you have a magnetic screwdriver, that much the better, but you don't have to if you don't want to. It's fine. I'm using a bit of a coffee table, so it's a little bit wobbly here, but that's okay. I wanted to get it, it on camera and still be able to use my, my hookups there and that sort of thing. They're pretty easy to uh, take apart. You know, if they're all rusted, what I would recommend doing is getting some WD-40 if they're all corroded. If they're super corroded, like they're completely stripped or whatever, you may need to use uh, a, basically a, can't think of the formal name of it, but it's a reverse thing that you put on a drill bit to actually take out old screws. I've not really had to do that myself, but if they're really bad, you might need to do that. You could also frankly drill them out, but if you need to do that, then <laughs> your Tatari is probably pretty, pretty rusted up. But anyway, there's really not too much to it. So you take out the six screws here. I'm going to flip this sucker over. The screws will come out. And then just sort of lift it up on the side right here. It's a little bit easier said than done. You know what? I am going to actually take out these other two. So on the six switch, you've got the circuit board here as well. 
the four switch actually just holds in place, and I'll show you that in just a second. But for getting this one out, I will do this. They're all the same screw, so it doesn't really matter which one you take out if you save your order. But I like to save the order just because over time, sometimes these things kind of develop their own personalities. You're better off doing that. Okay, that one is out. This one is out. Okay. There we go. Here is the top case. It just lifts out real easy, as you can see. What I would do at this point, take it just like you would be doing the dishes. You'll also be doing this to the bottom unit uh, once you get that taken out, too. Just put in the dishwasher some mild soap and water, scrub the whole thing down, let it air dry, of course, or wipe it down dry if you don't want any spots on it. Make sure it dries for about 24 hours before you put it back on because you don't obviously want to get water on these circuits. But, so here's the six switch Atari. You can see, particularly in this light, see the two speaker sections here? That's another way you know it's an actual six switch Atari. On the four switch, they did not have these speaker grills on this side here. If you need to, like if you need to replace this piece, with uh, all the little holes in it, if it's snapped or something, you can do that. I'm not going to do one of this because it is fairly delicate, but there's just some basic hooks right here that you would just kind of gently take out with your screwdriver and then pop that thing out, give it a clean if you need to. But like I say, soap and water does all you really need to do with that thing. All right, so now let's take a look at the unit right here. This is an Atari 2600. This one is from 1980. This, this six switch is from 1980. You can tell because they actually put a manufacturer's stamp, a little piece of paper typewritten on which when it was made. This one was made May 9th of 1980. It also has a lot number and all that sort of thing. If you get into a heavy sixer and you actually have any question whether it's a heavy sixer, this is what collectors will use to determine its authenticity. Because each one of those heavy sixers, they know the serial numbers on them and they can check it against the database of whether it was actually a heavy sixer. You'll also see that uh, the one we look at a little bit later is quite different as well. All right, so I'm not going to do it because this is, you know, an older Atari and I don't want to take apart this board right now. But this is the basic RF shielding. Inside of this metal box here is where all the circuit boards, the memory, the ROM, all that sort of thing lies on the heavy sixer. Here's your, your switches. So let's say one of your switches doesn't work. You can, if you take the board out, you can unsolder and resolder in a new one. It's not particularly difficult. Uh, the other thing you can do at this point, now that you've got a good thing, is get in there with like maybe a thin makeup brush or something like that. Clean out, decrud the inside of this thing. The other thing you can do is take like say a cart Put a bunch of rubbing alcohol in the cart and then just kind of work it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and that'll help clean out some of the gunk from that thing as well. They do sell retro gaming cleaning kits for this sort of thing. They're almost like little credit cards that you can do to put in there. You don't need to do that but if you want to you can. Alright so the other piece to really keep in mind on this 2600 that we can mess with on later but on this one in particular is right here. Do you see this, where this cord comes in, right here? I don't know if I can get it up closer to the camera. Yeah, see where it plugs in? That is the video out. That's an RC, an RF port, is what it was called. And on the other side here, you know, the Atari's had a long cord because they wanted people to uh, drag it all the way from the back of their television set or what have you to wherever they played. They had long cords, short controller cords, Eventually the retro gaming went the other way. So you've got a nice long cord here and on this end is the other side of it Another RF cable right there So if you have a bad picture on the Atari if the picture doesn't turn on If it turns on, but it's all full of static and crud it may well be that this is your culprit This is easy to fix It pops right out. You can literally just take it out the same way you would like an R a uh, stereo right and left cable out on your stereo and put it in. You can replace it quite easily if you want to as well. Let me uh, do one thing. There we 
we go. Got my picture back. All right. You can replace it if you want to as well. There is another thing you can do, but I'm not really going to get into it now. But you can actually get an RF to coax adapter if you want to run a coax cable out through the side here. All right, so I'm not going to take out the board on this one. But I did want to show you real quick one other piece here. If you do need to take the board out, the most important thing is see where this comes through? There's a little hole on the back here. That's what you need to make sure gets fed through when you want to put the case back together. Otherwise, putting the case back together is really just the reverse of what you did here. If you need to take this metal piece out, on a six switch I probably wouldn't. But if you needed to, there are some additional screws here that you can uh, have to unhook. You can lift the board out and then you can wash this entire board as well. At this point though, especially with a six switch, I would just uh, clean the inside of this with uh, standards. So what, what would you want to use to clean it with? Baby wipes. They're great. They're really good for getting in the crud and dirt. You don't want to do too much in terms of getting it on the circuit board, of course. Uh, for any circuit board work, you'd want to use rubbing alcohol. But uh, for just cleaning up some of the dirt and crud, like this Atari back in the day. When I bought this Atari and I opened up the case like this, it was full of sticky pop. Sometime in the 1980s, someone spilled like a can of Coke or something on the inside of this computer. And I bought it off eBay for like 20 bucks. And I got it home and I plugged it in and I was like, crap, my Atari doesn't work. It's broken forever. Well, if it's broken anyway, let me take it apart and see if I can get it working. Sure enough, all I had to do, it was a lot of work, it was like a whole afternoon worth of work. Rubbing alcohol, Q-tips, I cleaned the entire board, I cleaned the entire inside out, I let it air dry for about two days, I hooked it up, fired it up, and it worked no problem. Pretty cool, huh? Let me take a look at our chat here. All right, so anyway, the only other piece that can be a little tricky, not on the six switch, but actually on the four switch here, is this part needs to get fed through the board on a four switch. It doesn't on the six switch. So on the six switch, all you need to really do is get the pieces back on there. There's a little groove on either side that this will come back on. Put this in, flip it around, put the screws back in. Easy as pie which I don't know why people say that. Pie is actually not too easy, is it? Last time I made a pie, it was a heck of a lot of work. A lot less work than cleaning an Atari. So just put your screws back on here. And you are basically good to go. If you're missing a screw, you can get away without having to have all the screws back, but you need at least, you need to get, these ones are extremely important on the six switch because that's what will hold the top to the circuit board. And then you need at least one on either end here to, to keep a good solid connection. If you have a magnetic screwdriver, it can actually be fairly useful here because it'll um, let you uh, guide it in maybe perhaps a little bit easier and a little bit better. The other piece you need to watch out for and that I just did here um, is you want to be careful not to put it in at an angle if you can help it. Some of these Ataris, some of the screws go in at an angle, some of them do not. Uh, you don't want to put one at an angle, it does not.
Alright, so that's really all there is to this one, right? Easy as cake. There's not much to it. You got all your six screws back in. You got this back here. Power adapter and all that. You are ready to go. Uh, one more piece that is on here as well. If you need it, uh, on the 2600, the 6 switch, you know, old RF controllers went on channel 3 or 4 on your television, and unlike the 4 switch, which has it on the back, on the 6 switch, it actually has it inside of the unit. You could have flipped that when we had the circuit board open, but otherwise you take a little screwdriver, or perhaps a little uh, mini screwdriver, and flip it that way. Alright, so that's the 6 switch. Let's move to the 4 switch here. This is the one that I would probably recommend um, if you want to fiddle with it. It's pretty easy. This one is actually the one of the later versions that came out. This is the first one to be branded the 2600. This came out with the Atari 5200 and it's often called the Vader unit because it's black. Looks a little bit like Darth Vader, at least to the minds of people in 1980. It's missing this the wood grain paneling, and it is missing two of the switches, but it has a few things that are really nice about it. Channel switches on the side, that's one. The other thing that's nice about both four switches is the circuit board is not connected to the base. So, let me point this out here real quick. You've got two screws here and two screws there, and that is it. So, when we take these screws out, all right. this one I actually just did a couple weeks ago, so I, I know it's in a pretty good shape and can work. This one's pretty easy. One big difference though is because you have these things in the back, unlike on the 6 switch where it was plugged into the bottom of the unit. Let me see if I can actually hold these up together and kind of show you what I mean. On the old 6 switch, the controller port and the power port was on the bottom of the unit connected to the circuit board. On the, the 4 switch, it's on the top of the unit. So the only reason that makes a difference is getting it out is just slightly trickier. Again, you want to kind of just pry it gently open, lift up from the front of the unit a little bit, but you'll see getting this top unit out is just a little bit more work. You kind of have to just work it through until you can punch. Let's see. I might make sure I don't another screw here. I do. Alright. There we go. So lift up on the side, and then you kind of have to just sort of real gently pop it out from the circuit board here. So the nice thing about the 4 switch here, other than the detachable circuit board, is if you need to clean this, you just, again, use soap and water in a sink. Same with this bottom unit. You can actually pop out this RF switch again, you know, just pull it out just like you would a stereo cable, and then uh, clean this bottom unit as well. So if you have a label, you want to be a little more careful on that. So again, you don't have to. But with the 4 switch, they never actually connected it to the circuit board. There are, there are holes for these screws, but it just comes across when you take out those other two screws there. So putting it back is just a matter of placing it back in. Now you'll notice a couple of other nice differences between this 4, 6, and the switch 6 switch here as well in terms of the circuit board. One, it's smaller. Two, the components are right in front of you and uh, a little bit easier to work with. This one was made March 1st, 1983. Again, it's got the data manufactured generally on the shielding. 
The shielding on this is also a little bit easier to take off. It will probably break it, so you might need to re-solder. But there are these little pegs, teeth, that you can just sort of pop out, and then this piece will lift off if you need to get to the ROM and the memory. You probably don't need to do that, though. So, again, you'll just kind of feed this cord through, and then you'll take this bottom piece out, and then you'll clean it. Now, there's one thing I wanted to point out on the 4 switch here that's extremely nice. If you get your Atari and the colors are off, your blues are pink, your greens are brown, what have you, the 4 switch has a knob. See this little plastic? Let's see if I can get it better in there. See this little plastic piece that has like a little thing with a screwdriver on it? That will turn and act as your color tint like an old-school color tint. Sometimes over time it gets wobbly or it gets corroded or something like that. So if you're having color problems on your 2600, this is the one you want to check first. Just kind of fiddle it back. I put in something like Pitfall or something that I know the colors of that I can match it to because the Atari doesn't have natural color bars. But that's all you need to do on this one. Again, you would clean out the inside, clean out the circuits. If you need to replace any of the circuits or the chips on the force switch, it's actually extremely easy. Uh, if you've got a little bit of solder, you can literally lift up just about any one of these chips and diodes and circuits and replace it. Probably won't have to, but again, you can if you want to. But this tint is particularly nice as well. There is this rubber piece right here. What that controls is the audio to video syncing. So if you're having an audio video sync problem, like you fire your ship and asteroids, and it is delayed, this is probably your culprit here. If you take this plate off, you can actually turn this to help match it to what you want to do. You don't want to do that unless you have to, because it's pretty easy to screw it up and kind of difficult to get it back on. All right, so again, that's all we need to do on the four switch here. Again, getting it back on is a little bit trickier. You kind of have to feed not just the knobs through, but you also have to kind of make sure that it lines up on the back like that. So now we've got it put together, put it back in. And again, we are good to go. So anyway, that's, I mean, that is really all there is to a 2600. It's, it's really neat because uh, it's a very easy system to mess with if you like to mess with things like that. You can do a whole bunch of neat things on the 2600. And they're, they're built like a tank. So even if you get one on eBay and it doesn't seem to work, it plugs in, nothing happens. Generally, if you clean the unit, if you clean the case, if you clean the circuit board, if you especially clean the place where the cartridge port sits, because that'll get corroded, that'll probably solve your problem. Your 2600 will probably work again. All right, I'm not going to do the other four switch unit here just because it's the same as the one I just showed you. The difference between the four six unit and the six switch unit is uh, more pronounced than the Vader to the other four switch. But here's the later model, the one that came between the four six and the six switch. This is generally the one people are thinking of when they think of the Atari 2600. It's got the nice wood grain on the side, nice uh, coloration thing looks rad. That's part of what makes the Atari so much fun. Uh, this one still has its sticker on here as well. It says, manufactured for Atari Incorporated by King Tech Electronics Company Limited in Taiwan. So again, uh, that's another giveaway that this is not a Sunnyvale unit or a, a uh, true heavy sixer. Of course, this is a four switch. But you'll see that same sticker on the six switches as well that are not heavy sixers. It'll say made entirely in Sunnyvale, California, and it'll have the rounded edges if you have a real six switch. A couple of things that, uh, that I get, I've been asked about a little bit. Um, can you repaint the edge? You can. It's a little difficult to color match. 
but you can repaint if you're exceptionally careful with it. Yeah, let me do one thing here quick. My computer, uh, my computer just went into a screensaver mode. But you can. Uh, generally, I would tape off the pieces and put it in there. The other thing is, if you do want to clean this with rubbing alcohol, be careful you don't scrub. Again, that's why I prefer things like just a basic baby wipe on here. It'll get just about anything you need to get. I have heard that people like to use, and I will not use this, but if you watch enough YouTube videos, you will inevitably see somebody extol the virtues of armor all which is you know what you use to clean your car dashboard the nice thing about it is it'll leave a really cool shine on your unit uh, this thing will look like shiny and a lot of times you'll see that at the game stores because they sell better because they look all fancy they were not meant to shine these units were not really meant to have that kind of glossy look on them and the armor all will leave behind a residue that's really not that good for your 2600 so I do not recommend it but hey it's your Atari and if you want it to be all glossy looking you can use some armor all like armor all wipes and all that sort of thing to kind of clean it off all right uh, next step here let's see if I have any questions hey Samus all right so now you've got your unit cleaned your Atari 2600 cleaned and now it's time to do the same for the games this is probably rule number one. The most important rule if you are going to collect for Atari. Clean your carts before you put them in the Atari 2600. I know you want to see if it works. I know you're excited. <laughs> Clean your carts first. All the dust, dirt, crud, nicotine stains, oil, just gunk from sitting in a box in a garage for 20, 30 years, it'll all get on the circuit board. And if you plug it into your Atari, you're now jamming it into the inside of your cart reader there. So, whenever I go thrift flea market, thrift storing, and I pick up a bunch of Atari carts, I always clean them first. Give it a full day to dry, and then give it a shot. Cleaning it is easy. Same thing works for Nintendo, Sega Genesis, any of the uh, board carts. Use 70%, I don't know if I can get good light here, 70% isopropyl alcohol. They will sell a version of 91% as well. I would not recommend using a 91% isopropyl alcohol in the carts for this reason. It can discolor them. It's almost like too corrosive. I've uh, put 91% isopropyl alcohol on the inside of like these things and it kind of left like a white film when it was done. 70% is uh, safer for your uh, your carts and your Atari. So use that. You don't need to dilute it. Just straight up 70% is fine. So just get a little bit on a Q-tip. Clean out the inside of the cart first. You know, the plastic pieces on the inside here. Just clean it all out in there. Get all the dirt and crud. You will see some nasty stuff when you <laughs> pull that out of this thing. You'll see all the, like I say, dirt and crud and nicotine stains. And there's a lot of smokers in the 80s. And they smoked in where they played games, and so you see a lot of that kind of stuff. That also works for smell, by the way. Alcohol, rubbing alcohol will help clean out most of that stuff over time. Now the delicate part is if you, I can't really show you a good picture of it, but if you have an Atari cart, you'll see there are these little kind of brass looking, copper looking pegs. Those are what's reading the video game inside of the unit. So those get corroded over time as well. So just take rubbing alcohol here and very, I don't know if I can show you here, very gently, yeah, here you can see them there, very gently just kind of work this on there. You don't need to jam it all the way through the back of the circuit board. The only part that really matters is going to be those connectors right there. Take the rubbing alcohol and uh, just keep at it until it's clean. If you're pulling it away and there's some black there, keep cleaning. Eventually there won't be. And when you get done with that, again, you'll want to let it sit for 24 hours before you put it in the unit. You want to make sure, of course, that the circuit board is not wet. People will tell you it will ruin the cart. It generally won't ruin the cart. Now, if you get your circuit board or the Atari wet, maybe, 
But if, if you try to put this in like right away and start it up, it's just generally not going to work. It'll be a black screen. And so you just need to let it sit. Uh, the other piece I would do is on the outside of the units. I talked, I guess it was last week or two weeks ago about Actiplac, which is on all these Activision carts. You'll see like kind of this blackish, almost, it looks like a mold, but it's not. That's from the glue. All Activision carts have that. There's nothing you can do about it. It's fine. I, again, will just use a, a baby wipe. If you've got dirt and crud, something like that, real gently. You don't want to grind on the card, obviously, otherwise you'll be taking off some of the stickers. Depending on the Atari card as well, if it's a paper card, you don't want to get it wet. Obviously, you'll be taking that stuff off. If you grind too hard uh, on it, you'll take the thing off. But otherwise, you can kind of just give it a nice thing. Now, I do not let that air dry. I have something like this. It's like a record vinyl cleaning solution. Used for record players and all that sort of thing. I find that works really well for Atari carts because it's nice and soft. So after I've done cleaning, just kind of real gently dry it off so it doesn't have to air dry and get spotty or anything like that. And you're good to go. So I'm on the outside of the unit here. You can just take some rubbing alcohol, rub the whole thing down. You'd be surprised how dirty these carts can get, <laughs> even if they don't look it. I, you know, I've seen like a black cart like this, you take rubbing alcohol, just go like that on it, and it's brown or black or something like that. It's, yeah. Good time to watch Netflix. Uh, the other thing that will sometimes happen is you'll see, like this one here, the glue has actually come out from the paper. That's pretty common. There's a bunch of different ways to do that, uh, to fix that. And a lot of it's going to depend on what the condition of the sticker is. Something like this, which is in pretty good shape, it just really is all out there. I will use an Elmer's glue stick. Same kind of thing you'll see for, you know, elementary school classes. Stick a little bit on the inside. Very carefully, just kind of press it down. Keep it pressed down until it starts to get a little tacky. And then uh, let it sit and dry. It's not real strong. It'll kind of flip back up if it gets, you know, pushed again and all that. But hey, it's an old, it's a 40 year old cart in some cases. What do you expect? But it will help take care of that sort of uh, stickiness there. All right, so there's one other kind of cart I want to show you. Some of the Atari carts did not have exposed circuit boards. You can see compared to, let's say, this Frogger cart here. I'm going to put them side by side and you can see the difference. See how that one's exposed and that one isn't? You'll generally find on some of the earlier carts that they had these protectors. These are dust covers. So they generally keep the cart a lot cleaner. However, Sometimes you still have a dirty circuit board just because it was put in a dirty Atari over the years or just corroded over the years. So here's how you can get to it. You will see, and again if I can show you on the side here, this is the cart where it'll actually go into the Atari. And then there's two little holes on either side. These are little pegs that actually are lock it in place. So if you take like a little mini screwdriver and flip it up, You can then manually open up the circuit board here. Now that you've got the circuit board exposed, you can clean it out. Putting it back is usually just a matter of it's spring-loaded, so it'll just kind of fall back. But if, if the spring is bad, uh, sometimes you might need to kind of grab it and put it back. In that case, I'd like, you can get these at Walmart for like 10 bucks. It's for mobile devices, and it's just a real thing tiny thing to take apart like your iPhone. It works great for prying open carts, prying open things like that, prying open Atari cases, all that sort of thing. Really useful tool to have if you have it. But if you don't, you can even use like a you know, pliers or even a little butter knife if it's if it works good enough. All right, so that's really all there is to the carts. Clean the label gently. Uh, don't use anything solvent. So that's why I prefer just like a little baby 
wipe uh, without any kind of like um, aloe or anything like that on it. Because if you were to try to use Goo Gone, I mean, this thing is just going to just get destroyed. If you try to use Windex, if you try to use 409, it's just going to destroy the label. So you just need to use something gentle and all that. Well, what do you do if you do have, let's say, crud, crayon, someone wrote their name on it, all that sort of thing. What can you use? There's a couple of things you can do uh, that you can use. Good old WD-40. When spray, pre, sprayed on the cart, or even on the unit itself, will actually help take off some of that kind of baked on or crudded up super strong stuff. The other thing you can use is lighter fluid. You can get this at just about any gas station. It's for like Zippo lighters and all that sort of thing. Uh, if you put a little bit of that on here as well, that will actually... Uh, help eat that stuff away and is generally safe for the plastic. If you try to use Goo Gone on these things, you are most likely going to melt the plastic or discolor the plastic, discolor the unit. I've done it. I've done it by accident. I, I, there was a time where I was like, Goo Gone will be fine. Depends. Sometimes it is okay, but I would not recommend it. You're far better off if rubbing alcohol doesn't take care of it, a little bit of WD-40 or a little bit of Ronsonol uh, will or lighter fluid essentially will help take care of that stuff. Of course, if you're using WD-40 or lighter fluid, you cannot get it on the label. You just got to be super careful with it if you're going to do that. Uh, the other thing that I didn't do in this demonstration, just because I don't need to explain how you do it, but when you've got your unit apart or when you've got the carts here, spray a little bit of just canned air in here, especially on the inside of these units. You can kind of use it to get into the cartridge and that. It'll blow off a lot of dust and crud, uh, make things a lot better for you. Okay, so what else was I going to show you? Now we've got the carts, we've got the units cleaned, now you're good to go. You plug in your Atari and everything's working good, and everything is great, except your controller's busted. Oh no, my controller's busted. It's gone forever, I better just throw it out. You can also generally save the controllers. Even if they're snapped, cracked, or whatever, you can often rejuvenate them using parts from another controller. So, let's say you've got a controller that's got a cracked thing here. It's missing its rubber piece. The button doesn't work. Um, what have you. You can take care of that pretty easily. And I'm going to show you real quick how to do that. I've done most of the screws already, but see there are four screws here. One, two, three, four. You can take those out. You don't have to worry about it too much because there's nothing nothing that's going to come undone when you do this thing. Take out all the screws on this. And then this unit will pry up off the top. Some of the controllers are a little different depending on what controller it is. And then you'll have all the pieces here. So here's the top of this thing. See that plastic there? There are little it's kind of hard to see on camera here, but there are little kind of pegs that stick out. Those pegs will interact with a section on your circuit board to actually go left, right, up, and down. So, if your directional buttons aren't working, see the circuit board? See how it's got a plus sign? Each one of those, left, right, up, down. Easy peasy, right? Again, there's usually like a little kind of tape-like, almost a uh, plastic wrap kind of thing that's over the top of it, little film. That'll get crudded up sometimes too. So again, just rubbing alcohol on a Q-tip on the connections will often take care of the problem. Again, let it dry out. Uh, but otherwise, the other thing you might want to look at is the button here. The button is just right here. And there's a little spring that goes on the end. If the spring is stuck or corroded, that will often be the reason why your button doesn't work. So you can replace that with another unit. When you're done cleaning it all up, again, you just sort of take do the reverse of what you just did there. You can wire, too. If, if you're into wiring, you can actually take care of that as well. I'm not going to show you how to do that. That's probably above and beyond the kind of advice I want to give here today. But uh, putting the controller back together is really pretty easy as well. It 
It takes a little fiddling sometimes, but it's it's not too bad. The main thing actually, you know, I can show you this here. This circuit board has got a couple of little holes here. And that'll fit. There we go. Right on the side here. So if you want to put it back, I usually put the spring in, hold it down, put this board in, and then feed this one back through. This, the wires go on the same side as where they connect. And you'll know because it won't close any other way. Put it back together and re-screw it back on. Again, rubbing alcohol, maybe a you know, cleaning of the circuit board, making sure the screws work. If that plastic piece is cracked, you can take one from another controller. I'll put it on there. You know, if the if this rubber piece comes out, that just I don't want to pull it out on this one because it's in good shape. Uh, but if it comes out, you can actually buy these and just slide it back on like a condom. We're getting sexy on the Atari video computer stream. And that's really all there is to the controllers. They're pretty easy. Now they will wear out. Eventually they will completely wear out. So like the circuit board will just get worn down, especially if someone was abusing it or what have you. You can also, if you want to, you can make take the circuit boards out and make your own custom controller for it too. Make sure the buttons work. Yep, we're all good to go. Uh, so then finally here I wanted to show you the paddle controllers. You know, these are the ones that you use for Pong, for Breakout, for what have you. They have one button on the side and they're a potentiometer essentially that uh, spins around. These in particular tend to get kind of flaky. You'll see they get jittery. So if you're playing Pong or Warlords or something and it's like psh, 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 it's not smooth, what you can do is actually fix these as well. This will just pop right out. There's a little kind of peg, a little metal piece that'll kind of hook it there together. But you don't need to do that either. These are particularly simple. There are two screws on either side. And each uh, paddle, uh, assuming you get the regular paddle controller, has, comes with two per uh, input. The driving one is actually just one, and that goes 360 degrees. All right, so this one could be a little picky. Let's just gently take off the top. And the reason for that is because they these can be a little challenging to get back together if they all fall apart. See, there's the button here. And this is just a plain old potentiometer. I don't know if I can... Let me see if I can actually get that e real close to the camera so you can see it there. Yeah, see how that's in there? That is what's causing it to turn around and spike. So, generally, over time, the grease they used, the circuit board, or the kind of oil that was used in it, it gets cruddy, it gets chunky, and it'll cause your jittery problems. The formal way to fix this is to get some actual electronic circuitry oil, like some kind of grease, and use that. If you don't have that sitting around, your good friend WD-40 will work. There are some electronics people will tell you not to use this because over time this will actually get kind of uh, chunky and then slow as well. Hey, it'll last 30 years. It'll be fine. You just do it again. So I don't actually have the little piece on here, but if you just have the little tube, just get it on the side and actually feed some of it through there and then take your potentiometer and just go like this for about a minute. Spread that kind of WD-40 around. It'll decrud all this stuff and it'll help get your controller all nice and active. Then when you're done, put this back on together and re-screw it and hopefully it works. <laughs> it probably does. In my experience, the, uh, using the WD-40 method will smooth out the controller. If that doesn't work, then it's generally probably a worn out circuit board or something like that. You can buy new Atari joysticks online for about 20 bucks. Not cheap, but they work. Paddles are a little bit harder to find. So I like to keep a good set of paddles, two good sets of paddles that I know don't get jumpy. And then I usually keep a third set around just for parts. 
and so when they go bad I could pull from the worst set you know the buttons and things like that and take care of that all right yeah I mean there are a ton of things uh, actually let me show you a, a quick example here Kitty wants to say hello. Yeah, I saw the kitty. Figured I better uh, get the kitty on the stream here for you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, hey, thank you, Agent Brigman, for uh, for being here. All right, so I've got this is a collection of yeah, I actually have some NES shoes of the various controllers that I've got. These are the ones that I actually use on my stereo. These are all tested. So I've got the regular Atari joystick, regular paddles. This was more of a grip style that you could get. It has two buttons. Now the Atari doesn't support two buttons. But one could be for here if you like that. One could be for there if you like that. That's This has suction cups on the bottom so that you can actually kind of stick it to your coffee table and use it a little bit more like an arcade joystick. And then this one here is the keyboard controller. This came out around the time of Intellivision, no surprise there. And it's basically a number pad for your Atari. Mostly the kids games used it. There's a couple others, like Basic Math used it, and all that as well. I have one, just because I'm a nerd like that, but none of the games that support it are particularly fun. Uh, there's one more controller I could show you. I don't have the overlay for it right now, it's in a box. But this was for Star Raiders. You'll see a lot of these as well. This is a video touchpad. It was also used mostly for just Star Raiders. But theoretically, I think there's one or two other games that support it as well. And that's a, another kind of number pad that'll go there. All right, so let me think. What else? There was, oh yeah, one more thing here before I wrap up the special edition of the Atari Video Computer Stream. This is the best two to three dollars you will spend as a retro gamer. This is an RF to coax adapter. I don't know if I can get it in camera or not. It's a regular coax adapter on one side, the Atari female or RF female on the other side. And how sexist is that, right? I don't really think these Ataris have penises, but if you were an adapter salesman, salesperson I would say they do so here's the here's why you want one of these this is the RF cable this has to go into your television through coax back in the day you probably had one of those Sega or Nintendo switch boxes they sucked they were a pain in the butt they tended to flake out they didn't work very well what have you you can get these RF female to coax adapters for like I say two three bucks online stick that sucker on the end and now you've got a coax adapter to just go straight into your television most modern TVs still have a coax adapter and the reason for that is because they still have digital free over-the-air television and those over-the-air TV antennas still use coax if you don't have coax it's gonna be a lot harder to hook up your retro game consoles that use an RF adapter like this my advice if you don't have a coax in your television is to get an old VCR that has both coax in and RCA out you know the yellow red and white out so you could feed the Atari into your VCR through coax and then out through RCA into your television that supports it but most modern TVs even your HD TVs have got these coax adapters you can get those on Amazon you can get them all over the place 
RF female to coax adapter. As a matter of fact, you know, I'll probably put a link to that in my Amazon affiliate thing on the page here uh, in case you want to uh, support the stream and put it down that way. I've got a bunch. <laughs> I actually buy them in bulk because I, whenever I've got an old Nintendo, Sega, um, Atari, I just throw, well I don't throw out because I never throw anything out, uh, but I get rid of those old switch boxes and just real quick replace it with these, keep it with the unit and then you're all set and good to go. You're stopping at NES shoes? <laughs> nice. Yeah, they uh, they were Converse's. I saw them, I guess it was last Christmas or what, not last Christmas, but two Christmases ago. Uh, Converse came out with an NES special edition. And uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to end the stream by showing them to you because, hey, I bought them. I might as well show them off. So they got all the Mario characters on the one side, little NES controllers on the laces. Yeah, you know I had to have it, right? And then I got that awesome NES shoebox there. <laughs> all right, so that's hopefully, uh, hopefully a good primer on getting started collecting Atari, getting your initial system hooked up, getting it cleaned, getting it fixed up. There are a few problems that can be solved, not be solved through that above method. I have yet to purchase an Atari that a good cleaning won't get it to work on a modern TV. It just works. So hopefully you, uh, you would like that. Occasionally these carts will go bad, but not, not too much. Anyway, I'll be back next Sunday with uh, probably some more regular gameplay. I'm thinking about maybe doing top five or top 10 personal Atari 2600 games. Uh, so hopefully you will be interested in that. Stop by and say hello. Thank you very much for watching the Atari Video Computer Stream. I am raising money for charity. I'm an affiliate on Twitch, but I'm not making any profit. I am raising money for a farm sanctuary. They take abused, abandoned, neglected farm animals and give them a happy, healthy life outside of Menden, Massachusetts. You can find out more at maplefarmsanctuary.org. If you want to kick in a hundred bits, if you want to sub, if you want to follow the Amazon affiliate link, any revenue that comes into this channel outside of the cut that Twitch takes and the cut that PayPal takes is going 100% to the Maple Farm Sanctuary. I'll be back next Sunday for more of the Atari Video Computer Stream. Join me on Wednesdays for Mock Duck Plays Games. I'm currently in the middle of FMV Theater playing through the Tesla effect. And thank you very much for supporting my channel. I really do appreciate it. Hope that hope you found that useful and helpful. If you did, let me know what kind of stuff you might be interested in learning about next time around. Until then, we'll find someone to raid here in just a second. I'll see you around.